Welcome to another episode of the Recruiting Masters, brought to you by the CFC Insider. We're here in studio with Jim, and Gord is joining us somewhere on Vancouver Island. I'll let Gord tell you where he is. Gord, you there? Uh, yeah, I'm in the uh, small town of Shawangan Lake, BC, which is uh, where we have our cottage. So head over here uh, for Thanksgiving weekend every uh, every year. So uh, instead of uh, hauling over to Surrey and ruining my weekend, uh, you guys were kind enough to let me call in from here, which is awesome. <laughs> Uh, well, no, no, I, I, I love coming over from Bowen Island and ruining my weekend every weekend. Anyway, go on. Yeah, I live in White Rock, so like I'm five minutes away. So anyways, uh, we'll jump right into this. Uh, we're going to look at the uh, players of the week in the country, and then we're going to look at uh, some honorable mentions and then some uh, high-level performances in the NCAA uh, in U sports where a second-string quarterback lit it up. And then we're going to look at one of the top performances overall in CGIP, and then we'll uh, we'll touch on our uh, our recruiting tip of the of the day. So starting off, uh, back to the offensive player of the week, the offensive high school player of the week. Uh, there's two quarterbacks. They tied. I thought they tied. They're both CFC 100s. One is Eli Hetlinger from Harry Ainley, which is a CFC 50 team. He was nine for ten, for 224 yards and six touchdowns in the first half. I'll turn it over to Gord. <laughs> well. Nine for ten means that you were just uh, just warming it up, and then uh, your afternoon ended. So uh, obviously a, a good affair for him, and uh, it's good for um, Harry Ainley too because they're building for a big game this upcoming weekend against uh, Salisbury Comp uh, and uh, their CFC 100 guy Jake Taylor over there. So uh, that should be a really big game in the uh, in the Northern Alberta High School Circuit Edmonton area there. And I'll roll out the next one because the numbers are comparable. Jake Hayden from Holy Names in Windsor, 8 of 9 for 263, 5 TDs. Something tells me he got to sit in the, uh, in the second half as well with those numbers. Yeah, up until this week, uh, Holy Names had been rolling. Uh, Jake Hayden has a, uh, a CFC 100 receiver there, as his name uh, escapes me right now, who's got like 17 NCAA offers. So, I mean, yeah, he, they're rolling right now. They were rolling right up until Friday afternoon when they lost to Herman. So, as of last week, though, that's uh, an outstanding stat line, uh, five touchdowns and first half. I don't know if you want to chime in on this one, Gord, or? Well, no, it's just that Holy Names is another one of those uh, those uh, consistent powerhouses in that, uh, in that Windsor area. So, uh, they seem to be one of those factories that can just churn out that talent every single year. Uh, it's always helpful for a quarterback when you have a CFC 100 on the back end of some of these throws too. So, you know, it's uh, it's it's a nice luxury to have for some of these programs too, where in some of their league games they can they can sit their big guys down at the half, and you know they still put up their stats and their highlight films, but uh, they don't have to risk them for injury for the next week. Uh, obviously, it didn't work out for Holy Names uh, this week, but uh, always, always a nice luxury for the program to have. Uh, moving on, I just want to touch on a point that Gord made. Uh, there's going to be two football games in the province of Alberta this weekend where if you're a recruiter both in U Sports or you're one of those border schools, uh, St. Francis is playing the Notre Dame Pride in Calgary. So that'll be the Battle of Southern Alberta as far as I'm concerned. And then you're going to have Salisbury taking on Harry Ainley also. I believe it's on the Friday afternoon. Uh, so those are two games. If you have a chance to get out and watch those games, if you're a local football fan, I'd strongly encourage you to do that. Both St. Francis and Notre Dame, uh, they are schools that have had players go to the Calgary Dinos. Do Calgary's done a good job putting a wall up around Calgary. But uh, there are players that leak out of both those programs uh, to, to other programs in Canada and sometimes south of the line as well. Yeah, you know what? There's, there's so many high schools in Alberta. Uh, I think there's like 225 football playing high schools in Alberta. So, I mean, I would assume that Calgary at this point might get the pick of the litter. Alberta is uh, doing everything possible to steal kids from, uh, Al from Calgary, but there's going to be leakage. There's going to be kids who look at a depth chart and decide, well, I don't want to be the fourth running back on, well, maybe not running back for the, the Dinos, yeah, but yeah. I don't want to be the third string running back behind Rosary and one other at the U of A. So, I mean, they look at other options. Yeah, you've got that Notre Dame school in Calgary kind of interesting, too, because they're one of the few Notre Dames that doesn't go by the Irish. I think they're called the Notre Dame Pride. Right. Uh, they're they're uh, consistently strong every year. Uh, Tyler Packer, one of the big guys that came out of Notre Dame, uh, recently went straight to the University of Calgary there. And he was a guy that we saw pretty much ready to play at the U-Sports level right away. 
Yep, he was. Oh, he's a huge man. I know uh, one of the journalists was uh, taking in the UBC game versus Calgary, and they were amazed by not just the Calgary O line, but the actual size of Packer. It, it totally popped out. Uh, moving along, transitioning from offense to defense, uh, we're looking at uh, juvenile division one, so one B. There's a young man, uh, defensive back Keyshawn Constantine, who's not a 100, but may become a 60 very soon, CFC 60, who as a DB, he had nine solos, he had three assists, he had one INT, and he had one forced fumble in a, a huge win for his program uh, a week ago. Gord, that's like hitting for the cycle, isn't it? Yeah, it is, and you always like to see a DB forcing a fumble too. It means that he's coming down feeling and getting involved in the box most of the time. Uh, so that's that's a good sign for him and shows that he's got ball skills in the air, but he's also able to play the game physically and with some pop as well, which is usually what a forced fumble indicates. Yeah, that's a rarity nowadays in, in football in general to see a, a strong safety, free safety, like run the alley and, and actually put somebody on the turf. So, so good for the kid. Uh, he is a class of 2020, so we'll follow him up and see if he ends up on the CFC 100 or the CFC 60. Moving along, lineman of the week. Uh, this is probably one of the, I wouldn't say he's a secret anymore. His name is Ethan Vibert. He's also a CFC 100. He plays at Miller High School in Regina, Saskatchewan. He's a class of 219. Uh, he's kind of led his team off to a three and one start. I think they might have had a tough game against the Bulls this weekend. The big thing about him is he's played on a bunch of different teams, but as of right now, and it took a while for us to catch it, he has four NCAA offers. So he has South Dakota State University, which is a good program, UND, which we all know about, uh, Western Illinois and Richmond. So this is probably the top Canadian offensive lineman in Western Canada for the class of 219. You know, Richmond's an interesting name on that list with Dijon Brissett already being there. Uh, it's interesting. I, I don't know behind the scenes what the connection is for them to be recruiting north of the line. I mean, Richmond, Virginia, not overly close to the Canadian border. So that's kind of an interesting school that stands out on that list. But, um, you know, not a lot of uh, Saskatchewan offensive linemen slipping through the cracks. I think uh, everyone's well aware of the uh, ability that that province has to produce big guys in particular. Yeah, and when it comes to that uh, Virginia area, whether it's Richmond, Virginia, or Virginia Tech, uh, you've got kids that uh, uh, that are Canadians uh, not being necessarily recruited in Canada. They've gone to academies, like Episcopal comes to mind, uh, where kids have gone through that program and then ended up staying out in that region. So this is quite a venture for them. Oh, for sure. That, that's a long way to go, especially to Regina, Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. So... Um, moving along, this is one of my favorite players uh, as far as defensive back goes. This is the athlete of the week, so this is a two-way player. Um, he reminds me of like Winnipeg's high school version of Eric Weddle. Uh, he's a free safety. Uh, he is a CFC 100. His name is Austin Ball, and he goes to Sisler High School. Um, this last week, he had 14 carries for a buck 22, 122 yards, one touchdown. He had one reception for 13 yards, but now the impressive part. He had 14 tackles and one quarterback sack. So he was playing <laughs> his DB position and his running back position. But from his DB position, he somehow racked up 14 tackles and one QB sack. Now, the real question is, does he have the, uh, the Eric Weddle beard to go with it? Uh, that would be far more impressive, I think, than the football stats. Um, we, we keep talking about every week we're talking about that Winnipeg area and some of the programs, some of the talent coming out of there. I mean, it seems to be really rich. Uh, this year in particular, and uh, I know from a U Sports angle, I'm sure uh, Brian Doby over at the University of Manitoba is extremely excited uh, about some of the talent in his backyard. Historically, he's done a pretty good job of keeping that talent in his backyard, although I know he started to lose some leakage out to the OUA and to the States uh, more and more lately, so maybe the secret's out, but uh, lots of options for him in that, uh, in that Winnipeg area for sure. Have you got him down as a, as a defensive back for sure, even though he's uh, playing on the offensive side of the ball? Yeah, I, I have him down as a DB. I think he's probably, uh, and I told one of his coaches in the summer, I think he's one of the top five free safety prospects in all of Canada. I had him as like the number three free safety prospect. He's, he's one of only three true free safeties on the CFC 100 for 2019. Like, I love him. He, he actually comes down in the alley. He'll hit people. Uh, I didn't see a lot of his coverage skills, but he'll make a play on the ball in the middle of the field. Uh, he scooped and scored a fumble, of which he took like 80 yards. Uh, and he's played at a competitive level, both at his high school and then in various tournaments, both uh, internationally and nationally. So, I was going to say, do you see him, Clint, do you see him as more of a Canadian free safety or American free safety? Because that's a position where 
Um, it's it's kind of a fundamentally different position. There's there's a lot of difference uh, playing it in the 12 man game versus the 11 man game in terms of skill set, uh, what they're generally expected to do, all that kind of stuff. Oh, I'm, to answer that question, a big shout out to Elliot Richardson, who's the head strength coach at my alma mater, Acadia University. Elliot played uh, for me at Acadia and then went on to play for the Edmonton Eskimos. That's the type of free safety he is. Uh, a Canadian free safety who can sit in the middle, can play the seams, can be a bit of an intimidator, uh, and just understands how to cover a lot of space, the space that you wouldn't see on an American field. And we used to call Elliot the Sandman. So he's exactly like that. So, so what's better for him then? Is U Sports better for him to uh, develop on that wide field? Or if he has the opportunity to go down south, uh, is that a better opportunity for him, especially if, if he can get a better scholarship deal? I think for him, the case would be, you know what, go to Manitoba, become an all-Canadian, like, was it Rist or Chris or Rob Reist? Or... Rob Reist. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. I mean, kind of that kind of player. Go there, do that. Uh, put on a show in front of your home fans and your family and the Bombers and see where it leads from there. You know, play in the All-Star game, stuff like that. So, I would say for him, uh, University of whatever, and then in Canada, and just demonstrate what you have. I think he had a couple low-level offers from, like, Minnesota Crookston and stuff like that. But, I mean, yeah, he, I think he might even already be leaning heavily towards the Bisons. But, I mean, Coach Doby knows that after we've been given all of his kids and all of his schools all this press, I'm sure the OUA is coming. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I notice you're hopping across the, uh, the prairies here. You've gone from Miller to Sizzler. Uh, why not go back to Calgary with your honorable mention? One of my one of the linebackers who I think has the most upside because of his frame, he's six foot three. I think he's climbed up over the two hundred pound mark now. Is Simon King, who plays for Calgary's provincial power, St. Francis. So he'll be on display uh, this upcoming weekend. He had ten solos, one quarterback sack, and one forced fumble. He really jumped out at me at the various levels he's played. But like whenever I see a linebacker who's six foot three and can run like a deer, I get really excited. Yeah, I mean, uh, what a frame six three for a linebacker. Uh, that's a guy that you can you can bring uh, probably be effective pass rusher. Drop him into coverage. He's got the kind of length to be able to be a good man cover guy. Um, you know, there's there's a lot in the uh, in the toolbox there for for King. And, and like you said, he's not. Uh, there aren't a lot of cheapies in that Calgary circuit. If he's playing at St. Francis, you know, you know that he's got the competition. And in particular, you've got that showcase coming up this weekend uh, where he can really show off too. Well, and you also know that if he plays for uh, St. Francis, uh, we mentioned it earlier with Calgary and recruiting with uh, St. Francis and Notre Dame. Yeah. It's not necessarily going to Calgary. There's a bit of a pipeline uh, that can go to Regina sometimes uh, from that program. So don't be too surprised if uh, he might venture outside of Calgary. They seem to grab a few every now and then. So, I mean, and they've done a good job with recruiting the last two years. So, I mean, we'll see what, what ends up. I get the sense... St. Francis kid has been really good since he was in like grade eight or grade nine. I'm pretty sure that the University of Calgary have already spent quite a bit of time in getting to uh, introduce themselves to Simon. So moving forward, I'm going to jump all the way across the other side of the country. And he may be one of the top receivers in Nova Scotia. Um, his name is Riley Phoenix. Sticking with the tall athletes, Riley's like 6'1", 6'2". This last weekend, uh, he plays at Auburn High School. He's also a CFC 100. He had four receptions for 188 yards and two touchdowns. So I'll, I'll ask the Queens guy what sort of average you get from four receptions on 188 to see what he thinks. <laughs> uh, that's roughly 45 yards a catch, something like that, 46 yards a catch. Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's something else. Demonstrates that, you know, despite being a bigger body receiver, He's obviously got some speed to be able to pull away from defenders if you're getting that kind of uh, yardage per catch, too. So uh, I haven't seen the split as to uh, – I assume that there were a couple really big plays in there, you know, 80, 90s. But, uh, you know, it's uh, really impressive when you see a 6'1", 6'2 kid and you see indications that he can have the breakaway speed uh, that that seems to indicate. Is Phoenix the type of kid that could make that leap to CJEP and maybe spend some time in Lennoxville before making another move somewhere else? I think any kid who plays in the Maritimes, the CGIP uh, circuit would be uh, an advantage in any way, except for if they're like a priority recruit in the OUA or the U Sports or they're getting offers right away. I would strongly suggest they go and do that because they'll grow up a little bit. They'll get locked into a super strength and conditioning program and they'll compete at the highest level for below university in Canada. So 
Um, I got one more notable or one more honorable mention that I have to talk about, and he is from Regina, he's from Laboldis, who's actually having the comeback season of 219, or sorry, 218. His name is Riker Frank. Um, I know two games in a row now he's gone over the 200-yard mark. Uh, it may even be three. And I know that he's carrying the ball between 25 and 30 times a game. So when you have a running back that carries it 25 to 30 and gets 200 yards a game, you know that you have a special one. Plus, Gord, his name is Riker Frank. That, that's yeah. a great handle. I love that handle. I feel like that's a <laughs> that's a starting franchise quarterback type handle, Riker Frank. But um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, we've talking we've talked a little bit about some of the offensive line talent going out of the boldest. You know, that is a program built to be a power run program. So you know, he's in a good situation to maximize his ability there. But uh, you know, you go over two on the ground and. As a coach, you're just giddy with that kind of performance because you're you're gonna have a tough time losing games if you're running for uh, your your feature back at least I should say is running for over two on the ground. Yep, yep, for sure. I mean, and it always seems like the those Saskatchewan running backs are kind of like those five foot ten, five foot eleven, two hundred pounders who actually just understand the game and can stick their nose up in there. So, uh, moving along, we have a fast riser, and this one came to me this week uh, via email. I got his huddle film. He's from Westside Secondary in Kamloops. Uh, his name is Darlington Murasarana. Uh, all I got for you <laughs> is he scores five touchdowns a game. So I don't, I'm going to ask this to Gord, and I'll push to Gord. Have you ever heard of Westside Secondary in Kamloops? I have, actually, yeah. Mm -hmm. We played against them in high school. Uh, they were... Uh, Used to be a fairly strong double A uh, double A tier program here in this in this province. Uh, Justin Carpenter came out of there, played a few years at UBC, for example. Um, but uh, yeah, not not uh, not a powerhouse program these days by any means, but certainly one that's been around for a while. Uh, that Kamloops area has shown the ability to produce some talents. I know South Cam, for example, was a fairly strong program for a number of years. And I think way back in the day there was still a Kamloops High program. They were pretty strong, too. So, you know, there is some talent coming out of there. And, uh, you know, if you don't end up seeing this kid in the in the U Sports ranks, uh, I'm sure that the uh, hometown uh, BCFC team, the Kamloops Broncos, could start him tomorrow uh, because they're going through another real rough season. So uh, it be interesting to see where he washes up. But, yeah, I mean, five, five touchdowns a game, that really pops off the stat sheet. Interesting to see. I haven't seen film on this guy yet, but uh, interesting to see if that's – their offense just going through him or if he's just the guy that when he does get the ball is just making the plays. I don't know. Oh, it's just long play after long play after long play. He's like super fast and athletic. It was like he would hit any sort of daylight and then it was over. Uh, well, that's so the double A, that's the double A ranks in BC high school football, right? Is you can get some individual talents that can be really transcendent and completely change games and, and they stand out like a sore thumb when they do. I mean, I think back to, this is before my time, a number of years ago now, but like Adam Braidwood at, at my old high school, Siakwam, uh, who ended up going to Washington State, was the first overall pick in the CFL draft. He was that type of freak where you watched him on film or you watched him live in games and you're just like, oh my God, this guy is far and away the best player on the field for either team and just completely changes the fortunes of a team at that level. Oh, for sure. One player. Okay, moving along. I don't want to miss it this week because I missed it the last two weeks. We're going to touch on the NCAA the CFC 100s, the Canadians down the NCAA who had a huge game. We're going to touch on the U Sports super quick, and then I am getting to the CGIP Player of the Week, uh, our CGIP Player of the Week. So moving really quick, uh, two Canadians who basically make up the backfield at Ohio, uh, Nathan Rourke, former CFC 100, Malik Irons, former CFC 100, uh, Rourke, quarterback, 23 for 32 for 270 and three touchdowns. Malik Irons, 13 carries for 140 and two touchdowns. I'll push that out to Gord or Jim. Or... I'll take this one because we had them on on the front end of uh, Crown Countdown, you last week. And uh, Nathan Rourke was the uh, first winner of the John Cornish Award for the top Canadian in the NCAA last year. He had a rough start this year. Um, he was pulled from his first game. Uh, he was throwing for under 50% in, in, in the next two games. He's really turned a corner finally. Uh, had a great game on this uh, past weekend, too, over 80% completion, wow. uh, using his feet, another 46 yards on the ground. Very, very, uh, very, very good, and back into that Cornish discussion. Uh, Malik Irons, though, for me, is, is a great story because he had some personal problems yep. last year that took him off the field, and uh, Ohio decided to stick with him. They redshirted him for another year, and it's nice to see that he put numbers like that up in that game. 
Yeah, Malik, uh, part of a timeshare in that Ohio backfield, but you wondered if they would uh, see the issues that he was going through and maybe cut the cord, or he would decide to himself, decide that home was a better place for him to be. I mean, Athens, Ohio is a long way from his hometown of Abbotsford, B.C., so um, it's good to see that he really persevered, stuck it out. And, you know, as for Rourke, I mean, one of the things with a mid-major team in the NCAA is that oftentimes your non-conference schedule is the toughest part of your schedule. I, I believe they played at least one SEC team this year uh, in non-conference. I mean, I know last year they went to Tennessee because we were keeping a good eye on that game. But, um, you know, that can lead to some early season struggles uh, just by nature of the way that your schedule is structured. And, you know, I mean, last last week, th those results were against UMass, which is uh, nobody's going to be confusing them with an SEC team anytime soon. So, um, you know, maybe, maybe that's going to help Rourke hit his stride. I know going into the season, Ohio was one of the front runners for that, uh, the, one of the favorites for that MAC title, uh, or at least to be in the MAC title game. So it'll be interesting to see if they can hold up their end of the bargain and uh, get to that point uh, as everyone expected them to. Yeah, just a note on Ohio, they were selected as the favorite going in this year, and Rourke was selected as the favorite for MVP in a preseason mm -hmm. poll. So a lot of pressure on the kid. He, oh, he, well, for not, sure. a, not accustomed to that sort of pressure. No, that's huge. And the, and the MAC is uber competitive, and it's really good football. So mm -hmm. one of my – I'm just going to throw out a short story about Malik Irons. Uh, several years ago, I was here with one of my assistants. We were recruiting from McGill University, and the senior running back at WJ Moat had like 190 yards in a playoff game, and Malik was the grade 9 freshman sitting on the – basically sitting on the bench, and we saw him carry twice. The game ended, and basically we walked right past the senior, <laughs> and we hit the Malik Irons and talked to him. So – Anyways, but yeah, short story on that. Moving along, U Sports, uh, Connor Caracello. I'll let Jim touch about this one. He was the second string quarterback at Laurier. Yeah, and matter of fact, uh, Gordon and I had a, a pretty good conversation about the situation uh, at quarterback in Laurier between Tristan Arndt, who uh, started well for the first two games and then kind of went off the rails. Caracello uh, came in and... Uh, and uh, and replaced him. Uh, I was a little surprised uh, because he is a uh, he's a young quarterback, uh, and and he uh, provided uh, 21 of 31 for 453, and uh, four touchdowns in this game. Uh, a little more on uh, on Mr. Carousello there, Gord. Uh, you know what? I he looked like a guy that really benefited from having the game plan developed with him in mind this week. I mean, the previous times we've seen him, it's been in mop-up duty when Arndt has really struggled. And with a freshman guy, if you're not getting the starting reps throughout the week, that can be a really daunting task. Uh, so Carousel looked a lot more prepared this week. Uh, he picked apart a secondary. And, and importantly for Carousel as well is that his front held up in front of him. He got really strong protection on the day against a Carlton front seven that is one of the better ones in the country. So uh, really impressive performance from him. And, and that's... Uh, you know, I, I would say that if you asked Michael Falds at the beginning of August uh, if Connor Carosello would see any meaningful snaps for them this year, he would probably have told you uh, if that happens, our season's a complete disaster. And, you know, it hasn't been up to snuff so far for Laurier, but uh, they're still alive and in the thick of the OUA playoff race. And, uh, you know, if they if they hit the skit, hit the uh, hit their gear at the right time, uh, who knows how far they can go. But, you know, they had Michael Neville, who everybody thought, was going to be their presumptive starter this season uh, for various reasons, not return to the team. And that was something they found out pretty late in the process. So Arndt kind of became the guy by default who had lost his job to Neville last year. So I'm sure they weren't overly comfortable with their quarterback situation going in, worked for a couple weeks, as Jim said, and then Arndt fell apart. So interesting to see, I mean, Michael Fald's obviously an elite uh, quarterback guy himself. Uh, it be interesting to see if he can keep developing Carousel at this accelerated pace. And then, like I said, just because I said we would, the CJ Player of the Week, there was a huge game last weekend between uh, Andre Gossett and Vanier, the Vanier Cheetahs. There is a CFC 60 DB, Ben Labros, for Vanier, who had 12 solos and one interception. And they actually, the secondary did a good job covering up Kevin Mitel, who's also a CFC 60. So I just wanted to make sure I covered that this week because I missed it the last two weeks. Uh, we're going to push along to our last point, uh, and that is the recruiting tip, okay? We've had lots of kids who ask, is my seven-on-seven seven film good enough to send off to a university coach? I'll push this out. I know who wants to take this, Gord. You may want to jump on this one. Is your seven-on-seven seven film good enough to get you recruited? 
if you are an absolute freak show and you have no access to any other football, then sure. Um, but if you do have access to other football, don't even bother with the seven on seven stuff. Uh, it's just a fundamentally different game. A lot of coaches won't pay any mind to it. In fact, a lot of coaches are just going to throw that film away if they're seeing seven on seven clips on it. Uh, it's you, when, when you are a receiver in seven on seven, you have no fear of getting lit up over the middle or, or, and, and hit hard. Those catches lose their luster entirely. Uh, when you're a DB and you can get away with some of the things that they can get away with in the, in the seven on seven game, a lot of your performances lose their luster as well. The other thing too, is that as a DB, uh, it's not showing you giving any kind of run support. And as much as a lot of these guys like to think that they're just going to be coverage DBs and whatnot, if you can't step up and make a hit and run support, you are fundamentally useless in a lot of places. So, um, you know, it, it, and that's, we talked about it last week when putting together highlight films, you want to show off a variety of skills. The reality of seven on seven, you don't need to show off a variety of skills, uh, at least nowhere near what you do in the full game. So I wouldn't bother with that. Here's the issue with me with seven on seven. Uh, I see it as a, a tournament type of uh, uh, game. It's not a league type of game. And, and one of the concerns that I have is that I think we make better football players, not only in this country, but around the world, if you have football players that take an off season and yep. do other sports yep. and develop yep. other skills and develop other muscle memories. And if you're playing football, 12 months of the year, not only do you sacrifice yourself to potential burnout if you're a younger athlete, yep. uh, but you're also going to open yourself up to other types of injuries and not fully develop a, a, as an athlete uh, for the game of football. So if you want to dive into a couple of tournaments for seven on seven, that's fine. If you want to grind it out for four months in a seven on seven league, I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah, my biggest recommendation is like seven on seven is not uh, detrimental. I will say it'll help them develop some of their skills, but to extend on Gord's, or sorry, Jim's point, they're sacrificing time in their off-season program. They're sacrificing time with speed development. And the season, I think, has become too long. It just it has become too long. You're getting kids that are going to bounce from the season, then they go into seven-on-seven, seven, and then they go into the camp circuit, and then they go into training camp, and then they play the season all over again. So, I mean, to answer a lot of questions or a couple of questions we got this week about that, seven-on-seven seven film is probably not going to have a heavy influence on you getting recruited or not recruited. If you want to see some of that, you can see it on the recruiting uh, tips of the day on uh, CFC canadafootballchat.com there's actually a Dabo Swinney video and he goes into great detail explaining exactly his thoughts on it and being that uh, he's kind of in that upper echelon of where he's at you may want to take a long hard look at that so that being said well, we've kind of like the thing too we're just seeing this increase in these catastrophic stress injuries amongst kids at the at the high school level and a lot of this offseason stuff is what's contributing to it the other the other problem that i personally have with seven on seven is i don't think you're receiving good coaching and i also think that it becomes a lot about ego uh, you know one of the great things about football is uh, yeah you have your personalities but ultimately there's a, there's kind of a level of anonymity in putting on the helmet and just being that person in uniform making plays in seven on seven that disappears and, and in my experience a lot of the guys that i've seen coming out of the seven on seven ranks are a, a lot of big chest thumper, me, me, uh, taunting their opponents, that kind of stuff. You know, it's not enough to beat your opponent. You got to make them hear about it too. And, you know, that kind of crap I just don't have a lot of time for personally as a coach. So uh, that that's one of my personal issues with 7-on-7 seven seven as well. And I know it's not fair to paint the entire thing with, with one paintbrush, but, uh, you know, I had to get that out there because it, it, it is frustrating looking at uh, some of the habits that uh, that kids learn in those circuits. Yeah, and if it comes down to individual versus team and it's producing that sort of culture, it is actually detrimental to the game overall in the long term. Uh, I've heard it from coaches across youth sports. I've heard it from coaches across high school that uh, the game is becoming a little more individual focused rather than team focused. And the biggest strength of our game is how you bring all these components together under a single unit and a team and you learn teamwork through it. That, that may sound like an old hackneyed phrase, but, but really at the end of the day, uh, the biggest strength of the game of football is team. Well, that's one of the biggest things kids you would hope would learn from the game is how to work with the team, uh, how to overcome uh, adverse situations, how to deal with each other's personalities when you're under extreme stress, and then all sharing a common goal that you're trying to push and pull people towards as you go through your season or dealing with the stress of losing, uh, not hopefully not, not losing too much, but 
to the point where you deal with it in a manner that allows you to still mentor and train and teach. And those upperclassmen see the value in like staying with it, working hard and being a solid role model for all the young kids on the roster. So, so to answer your questions, seven on seven film, I don't think is going to be that, you know what, put on your best 15 clips, put on your best two halves from two separate games. And that'll cover off exactly what you need from the film perspective. Bingo. Bingo. So, from, uh, from my standpoint, that, that's kind of, we've touched on everything for this week. It kind of brings to an end another episode of the Recruiting Masters. You can catch up with our CFC 60s, our CF 100s at CanadaFootballChat.com. And I'll, uh, I'll see everyone next week, and I'll, I'll say bye to Gord right now and turn it over to Jim. Yeah, hey, Crown Countdown U, Wednesday, cbcsports.ca, and uh, Crown Countdown U, also available on CHCH-TV, Thursday nights at 11.30 after late local news. See ya. Yep. Sure.